Falklands War, 1982. High on a remote glacier, Special Forces troops are trapped by hurricane force winds. Royal Navy helicopters stage a daring rescue, risking catastrophic engine failure. Have I got the bottle? It's no good putting on a uniform and saying, yeah, I'm in the Navy. Of course I can go to war tomorrow. You don't know. In a lethal maze of ice and rock, the only way out is by radar. You can't see. It's like being in the dark, but it's white. Three helicopters head into the void. Only one will come back. South Georgia, a remote and forbidding outcrop in the far south of the Atlantic. 12,000 kilometers from London, the island is a British territory dating back more than 200 years. 11 mountains soar over 2,000 meters, with majestic glaciers spanning the gaps. From April to September, only scientists braved the hostile winter. But on March 19, 1982, Argentinian forces invade the island, occupying the few human settlements. Then, 14 days later, Argentina annexes the Falklands, 1,300 kilometers to the northwest. The British government responds in force. A heavily armed task force, spearheaded by two aircraft carriers, sets sail for the Falklands. But another, smaller force gathers in secret. Just four ships with orders to retake South Georgia. On the flagship, HMS Antrim, one aging helicopter is destined to fire the opening shots. A Westland Wessex III, affectionately known as Humphrey. 19 years old even then, it's now housed in the Navy's Fleet Air Arm Museum. As the veteran crew recall, Wessex 3s had a single engine with a worrying failure rate. I mean, the one thing I always uh, think about in retrospect, how many failures they'd had on Wessex 3 engines mm -hmm. before we went up. Well, I'd had two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. two, one in the water. Yeah, in Wessex 3 as well. Yeah, I've, I've uh, had quite a few heavy landings. But Humphrey is a much-loved old workhorse. The pilot, Lieutenant Commander Ian Stanley. And you get to the ed edges of the flight envelope quite often. It's when you get too close to it or you're being pushed by circumstances to get too close to it, that life gets uh, a little bit more interesting. Stanley's crew, Chris Parry, Stuart Cooper, and Dave Fitzgerald. Four men and the machine that carried them to war. April 1982. Aboard the Antrim, the grapevine buzzes about a mysterious troop of soldiers. We all sort of whispered to each other, didn't we? Are these guys in the SAS? Who are these guys? I mean, why have they got long hair? Why are they speaking with Irish accents? <laughs> and they start, they start we had them in our mess, and they, they brought all their guns with them. All oh, right. And they actually kept their they guns. They sleep with, with their them. guns. They slept oh, with I their see. guns. This is the elite special air service, hardened by years of covert operations in Northern Ireland. Now they have a spectacular plan to retake South Georgia by helicopter. The first time we heard about it, of course, is when we arrived yep. off South Georgia. Right. And they said, we want to go there. And we went, you what? The flight plan verges on the impossible. The gateway to South Georgia is the face of a glacier 
three quarters the height of the Empire State Building. Higher still, the route twists and climbs between huge mountains, while the temperature plummets. The drop zone is the very top of Fortuna Glacier, 600 meters above sea level and minus 20 Celsius. From there, the SAS will cover the last 15 kilometers on foot. Their objective? The Argentinian garrison at Leith Harbour. I remember you saying, why are we going up there? And this chap said to you, well, they won't expect us to come from that direction. <laughs> and, and, and you said, well, they won't expect you to come by Polaris Missile either. There's no good reason to do it. And I remember thinking, that's a really gutsy call, that. It's, it's... <laughs> On April 21st, the SAS make their move. The strike team, 16 highly trained specialists in Arctic and mountain warfare. Three helicopters head for the glacier. Most of the SAS go in two Wessex troop carriers, each with ample room for fully kitted soldiers. Humphrey takes the lead, acting as the mission's pathfinder. Instead of troops, the bulk of the cabin is filled with radar navigation equipment. The radar's transmitter gives the Wessex 3 its distinctive hum. Humphrey and its crew normally specialize in anti-submarine warfare. But for this mission, Lieutenant Chris Parry will improvise adapting Humphrey's radar for navigation. What we're being required to do is flying between mountains in cloud, because most of the days in South Georgia, the weather was atrocious. Heavy clouds, snowstorms, and very high winds indeed, and possibly charts that weren't entirely accurate. Co-pilot Stuart Cooper is an extra pair of eyes and ears, monitoring the instrument panel and the daunting mountain terrain. As flight photographer, he also captures a unique record of the mission. You can see the scale of the, the cliffs behind the helicopter. Um, huge, over a thousand feet, just immediate rise from the, from the sea. Air crewman Dave Fitzgerald keeps a doorway lookout in constant communication with his pilot. Even this barren landscape might be patrolled by the enemy. You're always looking out uh, to see the flash of a, uh, a small arms fire or something, you know. And in fact, the weather was so bad, if they had any sense, they were all indoors, and that's what we were banking on. The Argentinians stay undercover. But the real enemy is about to strike. We soon hit a real, a really bad uh, weather front. We got buffeted on the way in quite severely. We were working pretty hard to make sure we weren't going to crash into something. The glacier looms through thickening cloud and driving snow. With solid ice and rock on all sides, Ian Stanley is flying blind. The two troop carriers stay close, anxious to maintain visual contact as Stanley leads the way. Navigating by radar, Chris Parry struggles to find the narrow gaps between the mountains. I was desperately trying to fix the helicopter's position. Um, and on the radar, I could see these massive sort of edges against the, the mountains. And on several occasions, we were getting a mismatch between what people were saying was out the front of the aircraft what was on the radar and what was on the charts. The problem is, Parry's radar is really designed to hunt submarines. The radar beam is reflected if a submarine breaks the surface of the ocean. So it works best in a flat environment. With skill, it can be used for navigation. The echoes from the landscape give a rough idea of the changing terrain. 
but in the mountains, the radar bounces in all directions. False echoes can cause a fatal collision with solid rock. For safety, a skilled navigator compares the radar data with his maps and the evidence of his own eyes. Ian Stanley retired from the Royal Navy nine years ago. But now he's back in the saddle, over Loch Lomond in the Scottish Highlands. A stretch of water with steep hills on either side. 26 years on, Stanley plans to fly between the hills the way he did on South Georgia, blind. Okay, if you'd like to go under your hood now. Okay. With the hood on, all he can see is the instrument panel. Okay, you're in the middle of the lock now. Turn left back up to zero, zero 005. Okay, he has an artificial horizon for staying level. An altimeter for height above the water and a compass to steer by. When you're flying on instruments, and you learn this right from day one when you, you start doing it, you have to build up resistance to what your ears and balance system's telling you. So that what you see is right, as opposed to what you feel. Now, aren't you? One o'clock, uh, rate 400 yards. Nearest point land is uh, just jutting out on the right-hand side, quarter past 12, range one mile. The navigator guides Stanley towards a bottleneck, just 180 meters wide. But the radar must be confirmed by human eyes. The crew gives Stanley as many visual updates as they can. Okay, we've got nice wide open space out from left. To the left of the 335. Turn right to 330. His final destination is marked by power lines. It's a tight squeeze, but he's made it. The track, so you'll see as we come over the top here how narrow the gap was that you've come through. So, probably just as well I couldn't see. Yeah. South Georgia. With visibility close to zero, Chris Parry cross-checks the radar with the crew's verbal updates. We're picking up clues, glimpses of a mountain here, glimpses of a bit of glacier there, and we're trying to piece it all together like a giant jigsaw. Air crewman Dave Fitzgerald gives Ian Stanley feedback from the side doorway. You're reporting back everything that you can see, especially anything coming in from the side. I'm telling him, yes, you're at a 40 feet, 50 feet, whatever. Co-pilot Stuart Cooper senses danger all around. As we flew up the glacier, I was aware that there were rocks and, in fact, mountains on either side. I couldn't see it because it was uh, shrouded in mist, but uh, the fact that you knew it was there was enough to focus the mind, never mind your eyes. 25 minutes from HMS Antrim, they reach the drop zone near the top of Fortuna Glacier. The two troop carriers stay close, waiting to unload their cargoes of SAS men. But Ian Stanley will test the ground first. He and crewman Dave Fitzgerald must somehow find a safe landing spot. The only trouble is, they can't see more than a few meters in any direction. Loch Lomond, 26 years later. Ian Stanley faces the same task he had on top of Fortuna Glacier. He's flying on instruments alone. You have control. OK, I have control. Flying blind, he must reach the drop zone, an island in the middle of the loch. But like Humphrey, the helicopter has a built-in instrument to guide him. The Doppler. 
The crosshair gives him the vital information he needs, which way he's moving and how fast. There's a little circle in the middle. If you're on that little circle, you're doing five knots, either five knots left, five knots ahead or whatever. At little more than walking pace, Stanley fine tunes his position. Until finally, he's directly over the drop zone. Close enough for visual contact, even in a blizzard. On Fortuna Glacier, Stanley prepares to land. But one of his instruments has a problem. The radar altimeter, or RADALT, measures height using a beam of radar waves. If the helicopter goes up, an onboard computer brings it back down automatically. In theory, the pilot chooses the height he wants, and the computer keeps him there. But on Fortuna Glacier, something strange is going on. The, the RADALT is jumping and jacking, and uh, one minute it's indicating 50 feet, the next minute 200 feet. The drop zone is scarred by crevasses, hundreds of meters deep. I remember yeah. looking out that window on the other side and yeah. looking down and thinking, Jesus Christ, that just goes all the way down. <laughs> well, that's right, because at the fact, yeah, as I'm yeah. saying to you, this is really dark blue. Then it's true that's what they right. say about yeah. the inside yeah. of glaciers, it's Absolutely. really dark blue. The radar altimeter thinks they're up high. On automatic hover, it will drag them into the abyss. So Stanley stays on manual control. His Radalt and Doppler readings must be confirmed by human eyes. I'm telling him, yes, you're at a 40 feet, 50 feet, whatever. So he's also balancing that with what he's seeing and what he's hearing uh, from the flight control system. So, you know, you've got a big crevasse just out the window here. You know, you'd better move over. As we're coming down, I moved left and took up a new hover. We're going down, we're going down. And I did say to the pilot, you know, you're going down, you're going down. And uh, in the end, he said, I am not bloody well going down. Shut up. I said, no, you're absolutely right. You're not going down. It's just the ground on the right is coming up to meet us. Stanley decides to risk a landing. The aircraft's quite heavy, so there's quite a lot of pressure going on one of those wheels, which might just have punched through something like a snow bridge. So it was a long time before I put all the weight on the wheels. With Stanley safely down, the two troop carriers go next. Lieutenant Mike Tidd has the lives of seven SAS men in his hands. Instead of having you know, a rock face or something to give you references as you, as you let yourself down onto the glacier, you, you were looking out over nothing. The two troop carriers have very little guidance equipment. Tid has no Doppler to tell him which way he's moving. And yes, you can tell what your height is, but what you can't tell is what your relative movement to the ground is, <clears throat> and you also can't tell if, you know, 20 yards in front of you there is, is a 3,000-foot granite cliff face. But with Ian Stanley below him on the ice, Tid does have a way to get his bearings. OK. okay. The flight simulator at Royal Naval Air Station yeah, Coldrose in Cornwall. Back there. I'll just give myself a run in. Mike Tidd's okay, about to make his first helicopter landing for six years. Yeah. So we're going to take that down. That viz looks fine, doesn't it? Yeah, that viz is OK at the moment. Ian Stanley is going to give him a few problems. Just going to crank the viz down a little bit, uh, Mike. Yeah, OK. Got a little bit of light snow there. Christ, I'd say my viz is probably a couple hundred yards at most. Yep, 
not a lot to see at the moment. No. That's wrong there. Do you want to try a landing from there? Yeah. Okay. Tid's looking for something on the ground to give him the reference point he needs. And here's his chance. Let's take a patch over here between the trees. Well, that's pretty good, isn't it? You've got references there. Uh, yeah, I've got some references there. Oh, oh now we're getting tricky. Oh, no. On the way down, go, Tid keeps the same tree yeah. in his right-hand window. Uh, okay, when the rotors kick up a cloud of snow, he uses the tree to get his bearings. Come on, girl. Come on. That's it. There you are. Life is a bit easier when you get a great big tree to look at, isn't it? Yeah, it does. It does help. Good landing. Excellent. On Fortuna Glacier, conditions are far worse. Both troop carriers make it down, but the pilots are fighting for control. The wind was such that it was moving us across the surface of the, the glacier which when A, you're trying to unload troops and B, you're trying not to fall into crevasses um, can be quite disconcerting, really. The SAS face a 15-kilometre march to the Argentinian position on the coast. The troops cannot be identified for security reasons. The visibility was down to zero because the blizzards were whipping up ice from the glacier. It was colder than anything I'd ever been in. When I checked my weapon, it was totally iced up. But SAS mountain troops are trained to operate in hostile conditions. At the end of the day, they seemed to have the right kit. They had skis, they had mountain and Arctic warfare equipment, and they should know what they're doing. They'd walked a few yards, you know, and they were disappearing into the, the swirling snow and the mist. And uh, I, I remember uh, the, the, the face looking up and the wave, and uh, then we, we went. That was the job done, as far as we were concerned. We were very happy to get off the glacier and very happy to get back to the ship. But behind them, the SAS are going nowhere. Ian Stanley and his team haven't heard the last from Fortuna Glacier. As night falls, the SAS face the ferocious reality of winter on South Georgia. In the gathering storm, the temperature drops to minus 20 Celsius. Winds reach 185 kilometers an hour. Hurricane force. It was so cold that I couldn't think straight. I could even feel the pain in my teeth and we were all looking for signs of frostbite. Hampered by deep crevasses, the SAS cover less than a kilometer. They try to make camp, but the tents are ripped from their frozen hands. Shivering in bare sleeping bags, they're rapidly sealed in a shroud of snow. In relative safety aboard ship, even the helicopter crews are struggling to sleep. We were so worried about the, the rising sea not only uh, very choppy water, but also a very, very long and high swell were being rolled around uh, in our bunks. The ship was pitching around really, really violently. By first light, the situation on the glacier is desperate. The SAS have no defense against frostbite and hypothermia. No one wanted to admit it, but we were struggling to survive, let alone get up the glacier and onto the objective. The troop captain admits defeat. Their only chance of survival, to go out 
the way they came in. These were very high quality soldiers, ones we needed for the Falklands. Um, and we knew the situation they were in. We knew it was desperate. We had seen at first hand what the conditions were like and we didn't need any convincing to go back up there to tell you the truth. It was only going to be us that took them off. All three helicopters head back to South Georgia, this time in the fury of the storm. On the second day, the winds were infinitely more violent and they were more unpredictable as well. Co-pilot Stuart Cooper describes the scale of the challenge. This was um, the site that uh, greeted us as we came towards the front of the glacier. And you can see there's some small waves on the picture here which give an idea of scale. Then you look up and you realise you're looking up a very steep front to the glacier. And as we flew in, that was what faced us. Ian Stanley faces a climb of nearly 300 metres with a single suspect engine. The violent winds could smash him back into the sea. The crew are on maximum alert. Stuart Cooper knows the slightest mistake could be fatal. If you're too close to a cliff, you will get pushed down. It's, it could be in incredibly dangerous. As the air crewman in the doorway, my uh, major responsibilities really was to watch the tail rotor because you don't want the tail rotor even slightly touching something because it will throw you into a bit of a tailspin. Twenty-six years later, pilot Ian Stanley squeezes through a narrow pass in freezing mountains near Loch Lomond. The rotors are just a few meters from the mountainside. Uh, we're getting close to the cloud base. The cloud may be shut down on top of us, but I think the picture of reference is out to the right. Roger, you can continue. Left only 25 yards. OK, left only. Just clear, tail clear. Stanley must look out for sudden changes in wind speed and direction. Rising out at the moment, I believe, so... Okay, all clear. Thank you. Right now, Stanley's hitching a ride on an updraft. Warm air rising from below. Nine o'clock, 40 yards, to This means he can use much less engine power. Yards. We're pulling around about 80% at the moment, so I'm quite happy. Okay. Good air down the right. It's vital to have power in reserve in case of emergency. On cold mountains and glaciers, the most dangerous wind strikes from above. Cold air is heavier than warm air, so it falls at high speed down any steep slope. This is called a catabatic wind. On the face of a glacier, a helicopter is in constant danger of these sudden downdrafts. The pilot must be ready to fight back with maximum power. This is true of any sort of very steep cliff or hillside, depending on the winds coming from. If you've got an enormous updraft, you can find yourself in a situation with no power on at all. And then he might change and you'll suddenly have to take a great big handful of power to arrest the rate of descent. You've got to fight against them. All three pilots ride a roller coaster of rapidly changing winds. The downdraft put Humphrey's single engine under maximum strain. Yeah, what was going through all of our minds was, oh dear, I wonder what's going to happen if the engine stops now. You know, where do we go from here? We'd never seen anything like it. Looking at a solid wall of ice and going higher and higher and higher up into the cloud and on top of it. But at last, they make it over the face. Ian Stanley leads the formation, with Chris Parry's radar seeking out the route ahead. They soon locate the SAS 
barely advanced from the original drop zone. After 26 hours on the ice, even Special Forces troops are desperate to escape. Mike Tidd had got his guys in quite quickly. He could see down the glacier, he could see a way off. And because they were there, he was ready to go. As flight commander, Stanley makes a fateful decision. And he thought, well, there's a good window of opportunity here. You know, I shall grab this. And he asked, can I go? I can see my way off. And I said, yeah, OK, away you go. In these ferocious winds, visibility comes and goes in seconds. And I headed off down, down the glacier. And I guess I got about half a mile uh, down the glacier. And then the wind just kicked round as it does there, kicked round by, I don't know, 30, 40 degrees or so. And all of a sudden, I was into an instant snowstorm. Mike Tidd is in total whiteout, with no radar. You were looking out over nothing. It was like sort of floating in space. Tail hit, crash down onto the uh, onto the the ice. And I remember there lying there in my straps, thinking, "Mrs. Tid's not going to like being a widow." As the sudden squall dies away, Stuart Cooper looks on in horror. I remember a few expletives being uttered in the cockpit <laughs> as we watched this in slow motion almost. They rushed to check for casualties. Cooper grabs a unique snapshot. The engine's still running, so there's still some steam or exhaust coming out from that area. The crew are still in the aircraft. Uh, the, the guys are still in the back, and the door hasn't actually yet been opened. Um, and as you can see, the, the other members of the SAS from the other helicopter are coming over to render assistance. Myself and Ian stayed in the front of the aircraft because um, that's why I had time to take a photograph. We, we could do nothing else other than just hold on to the controls and wait because uh, to, to leave or let go of the controls or, or leave the aircraft would have been um, suicide <laughs> because the wind was so strong, anything could have happened. The only injuries are minor cuts. Six SAS, Mike Tidd and his crewmen squeeze into Ian Stanley's helicopter. Bless him, he said, God, you're a messy bugger, he said, aren't you? He said, you've left your windscreen wiper on. And I said, if you can find the switch, you go and turn the bloody thing off. <laughs> the other ten SAS pile into the second troop carrier. The pilot, Ian Georgeson, knows Whiteout could strike again at any moment. With no radar, Georgeson must stay on Stanley's tail, all the way off the glacier. What's your speed, Fred? 30. 30, OK. But in the simulator, Mike Tidd shows it's easier said than done. What's your speed, Fred? Ian Stanley plans to make the conditions as bad as Fortuna Glacier. As we head up the valley, what we'll do is we'll just reduce the visibility down steadily and yeah. probably increase the turbulence a little bit to make it a little bit more hard work, uh, regrettably, for you. Thanks, mate. <laughs> there she goes. That's a bit reducing down. That's better. That's a bit more like the real thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's pretty realistic, I'd have said. To maintain visual contact, Tid must keep within just three rotor lengths. Right, Fred. Now Stanley does his worst. Hold that heading there, and we'll uh, we'll reduce the visibility a bit further. If yeah. We can. Okay, and increasing the turbulence if we can do that. It's getting a bit more realistic now, isn't it? So you get. Uh... Yeah, this is better. I mean, all I've got is an airplane. It's him. Yeah. Still got a bit of ground there to look at, don't you? So you can reduce that ground, there's a bit more. Tid's fighting to judge scale and distance. 
I'm having great difficulty in hanging on to him now. Yeah. Yeah, we got virtually zero vis now. Yeah. It's a total whiteout. That must be what Ian had. Yeah. I've lost him. So, where are you? Oh, yeah, I'm still got 30 knots. Still got 30 knots. Let's see if I can pick you up again. Oh, oh just the ground. Oh. On Fortuna Glacier, Ian Georgeson becomes the second victim of whiteout. At the very moment when I put my head round into the glass bubble of the window on the, the side of the aircraft, I, I saw him plough into the ground. The wreckage rapidly disappears from view. Already overloaded, Ian Stanley can only head back to the ship. It had gone horribly wrong at that stage of the game. And uh, I must admit, I was, I was feeling it a bit. Um, just going over in my head if we could have done something differently. Twelve men are missing, possibly dead, somewhere on the glacier. What we were really concerned about is that the aircraft had crashed and everybody had been killed. We just didn't know what had happened. We knew it, it had crashed into the glacier. And I came up on the radio to the ship as soon as we were clear and said, we're heading back, we've got so many people on board, but I have to tell you, we've lost our two chicks. Ian Georgeson and, and his team were, uh, were really good buddies of mine. I felt as I'd been kicked in the stomach. But their worries proved to be short-lived. There was a call up from the ops room on the, uh, on the tactical intercom to say they'd managed to make radio contact with, um, with Ian Georgeson and co, um, and that they were all alive. With the temperature at minus 20 Celsius and falling, the downed men take shelter in a helicopter life raft. Already freezing, the SAS troops face another night on the glacier. Parry and Stanley go back to the drawing board. Humphrey is now the only helicopter left for the job in the entire South Georgia task force. We thought we'd actually run out of lives the day before, and we wondered whether we had any lives left for another mission up on that glacier. Another rescue attempt means enormous risk. They must somehow pack 16 men in an aging helicopter built for four. We decided we'd give it one more go before it got dark. I wrote a letter to my wife I include my uh, wedding ring. A lot of things were going around in my head. What had happened to the two other aircraft, the fact we were a single engine helicopter, old aircraft. I'd seen the conditions and um, just in case, just in case. Stanley plans to come in high the best vantage point for the surge. But now he's above the cloud layer, hoping against hope for the clouds to part. And uh, as we came over the top of where the glacier would be, I don't know what it was, but we looked down and there, a big hole in the cloud, a, a red dinghy could look down uh, through some of the cloud, through what, what we call sucker's gaps. It's where gaps appear in the cloud. You go for them, of course, and it closes up as you're going through it. That's why it's called a sucker's gap. We just thought, here's a chance, let's go for it. And then we dived straight down through the hole and landed alongside them. You 
it's only a sucker's gap if it closes up as you go through it. <laughs> it's an inspired piece of airmanship if you take your chances. To save weight, the crew must persuade the SAS to abandon their kit. They wanted to bring their Bergens as well. Yeah, Bergens. that's right. Armalites, about. Armalites from Northern Ireland. Yeah. 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 This has been with me for 12 years. Yes. I prefer yes. this to my wife, was one of the comments <laughs> I heard. <laughs> well, I just made that. I said, OK, you can keep your weapons, but you just make sure you unload them. Well, getting 12 guys into an anti-submarine Wessex 3 is rather like the competition to get how many people you can into a mini <laughs> and a certain amount of cooperation is required to get all these people and these were big guys in most cases. We just kept cramming them in wherever we could find a space. And I reckon about four of them sat like that here. Yeah, I'm and about sure that. four or five standing or sitting behind me here. We crammed them in there somehow and I remember them all being up this side. Yeah. And then two behind me as well. And in fact, one was holding on to me because there were so many people in, I couldn't find anywhere to yeah. hook my harness onto. The four crew, 10 SAS and two downed airmen squeeze in around the vital radar gear. Humphrey is now more than 600 kilos over the maximum takeoff weight. But Ian Stanley knows the wind, for once, is blowing in his favour. The fact it was windy and it was cold was to our advantage. Well, I mean, the fact we were a ton overweight when we took off, I remember thinking at the time, when we discussed it, of course, we actually had to wait for some of the wind to get up before we could actually lift in safety. Mm. Humphrey drags its tired old bones aloft. For the first time in almost 30 hours, the SAS can draw a warm breath. I'm sure I could smell burning. Half a dozen of them had lit up their cigarettes. And I'm thinking, hang on, we're sitting on a half a ton of aviation fuel here, and these guys are lighting up. And I said to the pilots, can you smell burning? But even the pilots are feeling the tension. The greatest danger is still to come. Landing back on deck. The standard procedure, hover alongside, then match the up and down rhythm of the deck, before timing the landing at the ship's highest point. Heavily overloaded, Stanley fears his single engine will fail at the worst possible moment. You need more power to come alongside the ship because you're using it to stay in tune with the ship before you land. With all those SAS guys in the back, we were thinking if we did ditch over the sea, or any of us going to get out of this because it would be a real bum fight inside to get out. Mm. Uh, and the Wessex 3 didn't have a great record for staying on the surface once you ditched. No, where well, the invariably rolls over. Yes. Yeah. And with the number of people who are in the back, I wouldn't have put uh, any confidence in everyone getting out, to be honest. The nightmare prospect, ditching in the freezing South Atlantic. This is the Royal Navy's underwater escape unit, the dreaded Dunker, where air crew are trained to act fast or die. Chris Parry and Ian Stanley are about to experience the ordeal of a deck landing gone wrong. A flooded helicopter in near total darkness. rolling into the deep. It enables you to answer questions about yourself. Oh, I got one. Have I got the bottle for it? It's one of the things you have to answer in wartime as well. Have I got the bottle?
Off South Georgia, this would be a freezing, storm-tossed sea. Hopefully, is an instinctive reaction to, to get yourself out, but whether you'd survive in the sea is a completely different matter. I think four minutes and you'd be dead. Not much more than that. The lives of 16 men in the hands of one pilot. Ian Stanley is about to relive the SAS rescue with his first deck landing for 23 years. Joining him again, Chris Parry. The team that flew Humphrey back to HMS Antrim. Right, just like the old times. Just getting the eyeballs moving around a little bit. <laughs> Get them back up to speed again. Approaching Antrim, Humphrey's packed passengers steeled themselves for landing on the heaving deck. I knew that it was going to be a bit of a heavy landing, uh, or as Ian liked to call it, a, more of a controlled crash. So mainly just need to increase the rate of uh, the end of the bank on this one, I think. Okay. And you've got to bear in mind that quite a few of those SES guys had already been in two crashes that day, and they're in the third aircraft now. <laughs> Does lightning strike three times? I reckon some of them must have been thinking. If the engine fails, Stanley must ditch in the freezing sea. Okay. Okay. I'm clear to move over. Yeah. God forbid, if, if one wheel goes over the side of the deck, the aircraft is gone. Smacked it on the deck, slammed the brakes on, and we were there. Quite a relief. Well, for a first one for ages, that was spot on. <laughs> yeah, totally good. no problems at all with that. Enjoyed that? Uh -huh. So did we. <laughs> By saving the lives of 16 SAS and four fellow airmen, Stanley's crew averts a shattering blow to British morale. And at that stage of the game, it sort of dawned, I must admit, it dawned on me, well, that was jolly exciting. It's not how we have any more of that, you know, yeah. let's do something very boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it didn't happen. And it didn't happen. <laughs> Why did that not happen? We don't do it for it. Humphrey and its crew go on to play a crucial role in the war with Argentina. Two days later, they're back in the anti-submarine business. They fire the first shots of the South Georgia campaign, depth charges, disabling a vital enemy vessel. British ships are now free to bombard the Argentinians into surrender. They make a famous signal to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in Downing Street. The white ensign flies alongside the Union Jack in South Georgia. God save the Queen. What happens next? What's the Thank you very much. What's your reaction? Just rejoice at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Are we going Good to night, more Thank you, Mrs. Mrs. Thatcher. 26 days later, Humphrey joins the full-scale invasion that finally brings the Falkland Islands back into British hands. But the success of the entire war began on South Georgia with one helicopter and its crew. Afterwards, you might say, my God, that was frightening. But, you know, just the ability to get on and do the job is, I think, is absolutely I think, I testament guess, to training. But I think the chemistry was absolutely right between the four of us. I think it was extraordinary leadership, personally. <laughs> It was extraordinary. <laughs> I, I think all of us could say, Ian, it was extraordinary. You're absolutely right. <laughs>